All right, welcome back, everyone. So we've got a crazy topic coming up here, the birth of the French Revolution. We're going to have uh, several lectures on the French Revolution for good reason. It is definitely one of the more exciting and dramatic and I think somewhat complex events in modern Western civilization history. Uh, so I want to do a few lectures on it. And, you know, when I talk about the French Revolution, I explain to my students that you know, it's different than the American Revolution in the sense that the American Revolution, you know, it's these colonists across the ocean. They basically don't like the monarchy controlling their lives and they say, we're out, right? It's obviously a little bit more complex than that. Uh, but for the French Revolution, remember, it's all in France, right? It's not some ocean away. And it's also not as simple as, well, a bunch of people mad at the king. That's definitely part of it. But there's also people mad at people in different groups, whether you're a merchant or a noble or a peasant. And very much there's these different agendas at play. And I think one of the most fascinating things you'll see as you watch this lecture and really the, the next few lectures on the French Revolution that I make is how, you know, you could literally be a, um, a leader, a, a supporter of the French Revolution one day. And then in a snap of a finger, you're now an enemy of the French Revolution because it changes so dramatically. So there's a lot to talk about. So I think the first step is just to kind of set up the objectives of what we're going to be doing over several lectures. And then I'm going to kind of get into this lecture, the long term cause of the French Revolution. For those of you who aren't aware, we basically get to like 1789 and 1789 all heck breaks out in France. Right. Uh, but it didn't just start overnight. So we're going to kind of explain that, too. So. What do you need to know? Well, basically, as I said, you need to know the causes of the French Revolution. You know, what are the long term causes, the short term causes, the events, the people, the reasonings why the French Revolution broke out. And then we're going to go through the different phases of the French Revolution. And as we get to each phase, I'll give you the dates and the time periods. And again, you know, you memorize all the dates and everything. Uh, but, you know, starting around 1789, we're going to start with what we call the first phase or sometimes, quote unquote, the liberal phase of the French Revolution. Then we get to what we call the radical phase of the French Revolution. Um, and then by 1795, we get to what we call the directory stage. Um, and so we're going to talk about each of these stages and I'll explain them in more detail and so forth as we get to each one. Uh, but that's the basic objective, understanding the causes. Now, one of the things I always emphasize with my students is it's not enough just to list causes. You know, if you have an essay topic on this, I want students to be able to explain the causes, right? So don't just say, you know, this, this, this caused the French Revolution. Why did it cause the French Revolution? And then a really good deeper level of understanding is can you find the causes of the French Revolution during the revolution itself? And what do I mean by that? When you look at the different stages of the French Revolution, the documents they create, the speeches that they make, do they go back and tie in with the causes? And again, that's going to make a little bit more sense as we go through the different phases. So this is like painting a picture of these several lectures together. And hopefully, yes, each one you can learn a little bit on its own. But once you watch the entire set of lectures on the French Revolution, then hopefully you'll get it right. So let's start with a few of the long term causes as to why people in France get fed up in, as I said, all heck is about to break loose. Right, and so a few things that are long term causes of the French Revolution. Let's start with you know, these are things I've covered in previous lectures, so you can always go back and watch those lectures again if you need. But we'll start with the printing press. And if you remember the printing press, 14, mid 1400s. And that's, of course, going to be vital because with the printing press, you get more people literate, more ideas, and the ideas can spread. We know, I think we talk about this in terms of things like the Protestant Reformation, the Scientific Revolution, the Enlightenment. And so these ideas that are going to be very important, that next point in there, you see the Enlightenment, you can have the most brilliant idea in the world. If nobody hears it, the idea dies, right? And so the printing press allows ideas to spread, ideas that will eventually challenge the monarchies in France. The second long term cause of a whole other lecture we've already done is the Enlightenment. So again, in my classes, I'm not going to I'm not going to go through all the Enlightenment again in this lecture because you have a whole lecture on that. Uh, but it's not it's very important not just to throw everything in the wall and see what sticks. Don't just go, OK, well, these are all the Enlightenment people and therefore they're all part of the French Revolution. No. What specific Enlightenment ideas help motivate the French Revolution. And so you'd want to go back and watch those lectures again if you forgot. But, you know, just to give you a sense, you know, people like Montesquieu and Locke and Rousseau, individuals who challenge the idea of absolutism, challenge the ideas of, 
of, you know, the, the strict control that, that we see in places in France and talked about, you know, Montesquieu, the separation of powers idea that didn't exist in France and how these ideas are going to help fuel the French Revolution. And in fact, when you get, and this is what I was trying to get at before, when you look at the revolution itself, you're going to see in some of the early documents that these French revolutionaries create ideas of the Enlightenment. So that's something you definitely want to know. Be careful, like sometimes I'll have students write, well, Thomas Hobbes was the cause of the French Revolution because I caused, talk about Thomas Hobbes in my Enlightenment lecture. But of course, no, Thomas Hobbes was not because he actually advocated for an absolute system. So you have to be very careful about that. All right, so the next few causes, you know, you can get these down. I'm gonna to go to another image here in a second, but Louis XIV. And again, some of these are things we've already talked about before. So I'm kind of going through them fairly briefly in this first lecture here, uh, but you need to know them as you're studying the French Revolution. Why is Louis XIV the cause of the French Revolution? And then you'll, if you want to jot down these next couple, I'm gonna to move to the next slides, Louis XV and Seven Years' War, that comes later. Uh, but why is Louis XIV? Well, Here's Louis XIV again. Remember, he ruled for a very long time, 1643 to 1715. And if you go back and watch that lecture, you know, I talked about how Louis XIV was this pure absolute monarch, spent a lot of money, bankrupted much of France, um, you know, alienated a lot of people like the Huguenots. Um, so those are, again, things in previous lectures that you'd want to be able to explain. If you tick off enough people from enough different groups, you're going to eventually get, you know, an issue. Now, this is 1715. Notice, again, I always tell students, you don't need to memorize the dates. But 1715, guys, this is still decades before the revolution begins. So even with Louis XIV, when he dies in 1715, you can easily make an argument that the French Revolution could have been avoided. So the question is, is what happens after Louis XIV that helps still bring about the revolution? And one of the factors that I haven't really talked about yet in previous lectures, but I am going to be in this one, is the reign of his grand, or great grandson, actually, Louis XV, all right? Uh, because he outlived all the other uh, monarchs, uh, all his other kids and stuff. So Louis the Fifteenth comes in next, and during the reign of Louis the Fifteenth, there's a couple issues that are also going to help. Eventually, I think it can make the argument trigger the French Revolution. So let's take a look. So here you have a map that I'm going to talk about, also in the same frame as talking about Louis the Fifteenth, right? So during the reign of Louis the Fifteenth, again, basically from 1715 to 1774, he ruled for a long time as well. Things don't go that well. And one really good example of this during the reign of Louis the Fifteenth is the, is the story of the Seven Years' War. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Seven Years' War, um, this is more for American history. Very often it's taught, sometimes referred to the French Indian War, which is a couple of years longer. Um, and if you look at our map, it's pretty dramatic. Basically, I'm just going to give you the brief version of this. Look on the map here on the left and you see the different colors, right? And what you see on this map on the left is the orange represents territory the French had in the colonies. The yellow, of course, is the British, the 13 colonies, and the green is Spain. And what had happened as, as the, you know, struggles over this new world were taking place and the British and the French and the Spaniards all wanted territory over this land, eventually, for a few reasons, a whole war breaks out. And what I want to see is what happens when the war ends. So this is the map on the left is the before and pay attention to the color, the orange, right? All of that is territory the French had. And initially, you know, the French were probably doing okay, but the big advantage that the British and the Spaniards have over the French is they have better navies. And they were able to bring more supplies and more men. And then look what happens on the other side here. What happened to all the orange territory that the French had? They lost it. So you go, okay, well, I get how this is pretty important. Now, they will regain some of this land back later in other treaties and uh, other agreements, just if anybody's familiar with this. So, yes, that's true. They'll gain some of this land back. But they lose a good chunk of real estate to the British and Spain. And you say, well, okay, how is this the cause of the French Revolution? Well, remember, this is during the reign of Louis XV, absolute monarch of France. This drains resources. It, you know, makes the monarch doesn't doesn't look strong. You know, Louis the Fifteenth is also going to have a war with Prussia during this time uh, against a man named Frederick the Second. I didn't put his name up there, uh, but if you remember, he has a war with Prussia. That's fine, and that doesn't go well for him either. So as a monarch, he's not looking very strong. He's not looking very effective. 
And if you have an absolute system, this also is going to hurt the reputation of the monarchy. It's costing them money. And so all in all, the reign of Louis the 15th is not that successful in those senses, right? He, he loses the war. He loses another battle with Prussia. He's still following a lot of the ideas of Louis the 14th of this absolute way of behavior that I covered in previous lectures. And so all in all, you know, again, as, as he dies in 1774, 1775, right around then, you know, we're getting closer to the French Revolution time period. And I think you could even make the argument even at that point, the French Revolution could have possibly been avoided. But even after his death, things then continue to spiral. And how they spiral and how that final spiral leads to the final beginning of the French Revolution is what I'm going to cover in our next lecture. All right, so we'll just keep going on this. Thank you guys. I hope that first part was very clear. All right, have a great day.